stop boxing. And over the next little while, I'm thinking taking some time on this class. or HMJ or GBCC. Um, before we get started, I just want to make a point by saying thank you so much to the Ontario Arts Council. This project owes them double thanks. Um, the piece that we're working on is based on a piece called The Last Days of the Family Portrait Studio that was written with a really generous composition grant from them last year by Tim Shaw and the worst pop band ever. And this project is kind of the final celebration um, for another project that the OAC funded through their uh, Artists and Community Collaboration Program. And uh, all the love in the world to the awesome community of One Penny and Penny. So what we're gonna be doing today, what I'm gonna be doing today is um, working my way through some artwork that everyone's been trying to do this week. And tomorrow there's a, a stream on this channel where we're gonna uh, meet up with the musicians and uh, try and do a little bit of um, sharing of the art that everybody's made. So uh, this whole piece is based on um, a really great little radio play that we've got courtesy of the worst pop band ever. I can post the comment. Um, and the, for what we're trying to do right now is this story has, this story has um, music and art connected to each other. So this week what we're trying to do is we're trying to listen to the music and we're trying to create the art that will go with it. Um, that's what we're doing today, and I haven't had time to make my art. So what I'm going to do right now is listen to the radio play, and I'm going to just kind of start one piece of art for each song, because the radio play just has the short little piece, and then I'm going to take a little break, and then I might come back and just keep working on my paintings while I listen to the longer version. Um, so... You should just get together whatever art materials you have lying around the house. I just have a bunch of old paintings. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the camera angle so that you can kind of see. Oh, someone's coming in the door. So you can kind of see my paper. There we go. I've just taped a bunch of smaller pieces of paper together. Because that's what the person in the story does, sort of. And if you want to see some pictures, of the first version of the last days of the family portrait studio from last summer um, and the way those backdrops look. We've posted some of those on our Facebook group. Hello. Welcome to the art party. Um, so I'm really, really hoping that by playing the music the way I've got it set up, you can hear what I'm listening to. But if not, feel free to click over in the link uh, on the side there, and that'll give you uh, a pretty good sense of what it is I'm working on. Uh, so let's Um, here we go. This is the worst photo booth ever. Oh, someone's coming back in the door. Hello, welcome to the art party happening online right now. Here we go. Clarin was a funny name for a girl. She was named 
named after her father's favorite member of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band. A large African-American man named Clarence Clements played a mean saxophone. When she was born, her father mistook her umbilical cord for enlarged male genitalia and excitedly proclaimed to everyone in the delivery room that his child would be called Clarence. In fact, the only reason that he did not immediately try and lift the baby up like the baboon did to Simba in The Lion King was because his wife knew he would get overexcited and made him promise beforehand not to do that. The nurse had thought Clarence an odd pick for a girl's name, and it wasn't until his poor wife, who had just toughed out 22 hours of labor, realized that while Clarence was the agreed-upon boy's name, the baby was in fact a girl. Unfortunately, by the time she had tried to challenge the name choice, the father had already registered the baby's name, and the exhausted mother was just too tired to fight. This is to say, from an early age, Clarence noticed that her easily excitable father was a devastating source of embarrassment. However, she would discover that he had less opportunity to act out at fine art events than at school sporting events. Natasha, so she quickly turned her energies to art activities in an effort to avoid a childhood of shame. Halfway through her senior year of high school, Clarence landed a part-time job at the portrait studio at the local department store. This was great because it was going to help pay for some of her expenses when she started art college in the fall. Yay. Unfortunately, three months in, all the employees were told that the department store was going bankrupt and closing by the end of the summer. This sucked because she'd have to find another job. But... It was great because she suddenly became the boss. Upper management just didn't really care that an angsty high school teenager was now in charge of a few final bookings. The studio was very old and very simple. It had never really been updated to have digital backgrounds and such. It was just real props and real backdrops. It was the kind of studio that produced those classic awkward family photos back in the day. This totally fit with Clarence's generally quirky and Luddite aesthetic, and she actually enjoyed going to work. When she wasn't working or going to school, so this first Clarence round would listen to music round. and work on her art. Her latest piece had to do with the Buddhist notion of universal truth, common to all people. She'd been inspired by the music and tweets by the acclaimed pianist and self-help guru, Adrian Fulusa. She had a song called Blue Dharma. She wasn't sure what the blue part meant, or even really how to pronounce it. Blue Ed, blue. Louis, but she was sure it was probably pretty profound. When she finished the piece, she thought, what if I blew it up and used it as a backdrop of the studio? So just as a joke and because no one was there to stop her, she did just that. When she looked into getting the image printed at the proper size, she realized it would be way too expensive. So like every good millennial, she watched YouTube and figured out how to print it up herself on the cheap. She then stuck the picture into the studio and offered it as a backdrop option to customers. Thank you. 
us for doing this and I'll go back and work on this. What's your first problem? Blue Dharma was a hit with your customers. But you don't have to she do that. She found it, it to be a perfectly catchy band prop and treated it more like an Instagram opportunity. In fact, through word of mouth and the magic of social media, bookings at the portrait studio increased by a hundredfold in just one week. She even got to hire her twin sisters, Enrique Iglesias and Tim Horton, to help with the customers. The twins were also named after heroes of her father. And the names were what they were because their mother had chosen to pick different battles to fight with their husband. Clarence then had a crazy idea. What if she printed some more drawings and created more of a photo booth vibe? Or at least put it out as an option. She'd call it the worst photo booth ever or WPBE. So, for her next backdrop, she thought about the emotional highs and lows she'd gone through with her beloved Toronto Raptors winning the NBA championship, but then losing Kawhi Leonard to free agency, all in the space of a month. She took solace by reading about the Taoist concept of yin and yang, and by listening to the solo works of pop crooner and notorious Lothario, Drew Burstyn. She entitled the new image, All That's Left. <laughs> Dance in the sky until the stars come out at night. I'll see when the sun begins to fade. That's all that now the sun to bring into your soul. Shine your light through my love. Wake it up every morning. All may stay now forever. All oh, my love, I am sending. Despite the success of the photo booth, one day, Clarence received the terrible news that her best friend was moving to Brazil. So she tried to comfort herself by painting. Clarence decided to paint a picture of sailing. She didn't know anything about boats and doubted she could ever afford to own one. But she had a fantasy of sailing across the ocean to hang out with her friend. While painting, she listened to a new group her friend had hipped her to. The band's name was Hector. And she had their song Richard Rhyme on repeat while she painted. She loved the song and wasn't even bothered by the rumor that the band leader, Chris Gale, was not a natural redhead. <laughs> something for her easily excitable father, who was probably the primary reason she was in the fine arts. While he had expressed appreciation for her earlier artwork at home, she had overheard him telling her mother that while he thought they were nice, 
He wasn't always sure what he was looking at. He was worried that she wouldn't make any money later in life with the more abstract work. Like virtually every father these days, he was really hoping she'd become a contractor. So she thought she'd draw something that he liked. She wound up drawing a picture of three lucky goldfish in a traditional Chinese style to represent her and so her sister. She tried to pay homage to her father's favorite artist, renowned dilettante Howie Shaw. She entitled the work Thanks for Coming Out as her final piece. Since her dad had booked the last day of the studio with shoots for family and friends to show off his daughter's work, when she unveiled the backdrop, her proud dad was moved to tears by the piece, but still managed to get a hundred selfies with everyone through the tears. And since she was still the boss, Clarence decided to make the last day of the department store portrait studio a day to remember and invited a friend's band to play some music while she took the final photo. The band sounded a lot like the music of hip hop star Leo 37, but with less swearing, and they called themselves the worst pop band ever in honor of the photo booth. They even had t shirts made. It wound up being an amazing party with a best friend old co-workers, former clients, her family, and even complete strangers showing up. This is because Clarence had become a minor IG celebrity. And not that she really cared, but she was pretty sure even Kawhi Leonard was following her with a fake account. The last song the band played before they turned off the lights was written by one of the band's keyboard players, the winking Welshman, David Hughes, who named the song Einor Man, not Iron Man, Einor. No one knew why. album cover ever. <laughs> Is we're gonna take a little pause. I'll post the next link uh, on the the comments underneath here. So have a little stand and stretch. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through, I'm gonna go through one at a time. And instead of listening to the radio play, um, I'm gonna sort of listen to the whole piece of music that inspired each of those chapters. And um, in case you're interested, 
you can find all of the activities, sort of things we gave ourselves to think about as artists working on this project. I'll post a link in the comments before I log off so that you can see where to go. And if you wanna have a little look through there, you'll have a better idea of what it is I'm doing when we come back. So it's 2.30, tune back in at 2.45, and I'll be back to sort of focus in on the first piece of art in, in our little story. So here we go, guys, here's the link. Feel free to see what it is we're talking about. And we'll see you back on this channel. I guess that's the other way. I guess people like subscribe or something to these channels. Um, pop back in about 15 minutes. Today is Friday, May 1st, and it's Worst Photo Booth, day five. See you soon.